Go for hey, it. Hey, thanks a lot, you guys. I was told by Catherine, I have about 15 minutes, so I'm going to try to be succinct, but I also wanted to give you all some background on the work that I do since you may not be familiar with my work because I've been uh, running the Startup Art Fair for the last five years. Um, I have this PowerPoint that I'm going to share with you. Tell me if you can see it when I click on it. Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. Hey, we is can that coming see through? Okay. Yep. Got it. All right. I'm going to try to that's scroll cool. back to the beginning. Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the exciting part of my life right there. <laughs> Got to. I feel oh, like my life is flashing before my eyes, too. <laughs> Hang on a second. I'm going to fix this right now. Oh, yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Um, <laughs> this is from an old PowerPoint um, that I used to use called uh, Cash, Porn, and Theft, How I Make My Art. It'll kind of be self-explanatory, but I just wanted to give you guys like a five-minute or or less um, update on kind of what I've done in the last 20 years of my life as a, as a working artist. I did a project for about eight years in the early 2000s where I remade famous works from the 20th century out of money. And it was really because I was interested in how we talk about money and how we value art and how we talk about art in terms of money. So I figured the easiest, dumbest, direct way is to make the work out of money. And I called it counterfeit because the artwork was fake, but the money was real. So, of course, I started with um, Duchamp's urinal. Um, and so these are all uh, exactly the size, scale, and dimensions of the original, only they're made out of U.S. currency. Uh, they're sewn on a machine, usually. So they're a bit like quilts or soft sculptures. And I probably redid every famous work of art from the 20th century from Duchamp up to Jeff Koons. Wow. And it was a great, the reason why I show this to begin with is because it shows my love of art and art history and artists. And one of the things I learned is in the old days, they used to um, have art students paint from the old masters. And now that seems really antiquated and outdated. But I, in fact, I, I learned a lot about these artists and about art history by remaking their work. So instead of repainting it, I was just remaking it out of sewn currency. Jasper Johns, Jeff Koons, um, Andy Warhol. Um, so the next body of work, which leads into which comes out of this was because I had spent a lot of time on the internet researching images of famous artworks and um, I used them to make patterns so I could make the actual work. But what I noticed one time when I was looking for this Maryland image was I found it in the background of a porn shot and it got me thinking about <laughs> where Oops. and how porn is made. It's often made in people's homes and hotels and often art is used as a background and it's often a secondary thought. And I thought it'd be really interesting to try to research and find um, instances where um, artwork was used in the background of porn shots. So I made this whole body of work called Hot and found, you know, like Starry Night uh, behind some copulating couple, um, rando, you know, abstract paintings, um, I think this is Manet might be actually in the background of this a lady's shot. Two cans. That's kind of a pun. <laughs> um, all of the uh, titles of the of these pieces came from emails that I used to get spam porn emails, hot, huge, old school. Um, they're done as digital prints and they were unique and it was kind of just a little foray out of um, the money work, but still kind of connected to art history in this kind of weird way. Um, the next body of work I did was uh, 
not involved with art history, but it was taking this idea of appropriation to kind of its ultimate end. So I started to take items of little value from people that I knew, um, friends and family. And then what I would do is, so like, you know, ice scrapers, um, dildos, um, children's balls. You stole somebody's dildo? Um, you're gonna see in here some items that you'd be surprised were found in people's homes. But one thing I had to start, so I made them into these assemblages that I kind of glued together and then resin together, but I covered them with this flocking and this flocking is money dust. It's the, all the leftover scraps from the counterfeit um, pieces that I ground up into dust. And I used it for a couple of reasons. One is to kind of obscure the provenance of the of the objects and the other is to kind of again talk about its you know relative perceived value all these objects i stole were of little value and they weren't even noticed by most people um, you know belts and boxes and handcuffs who knew some of my friends were pretty kinky silverware and i was just making them into more formally driven um, objects, but I was interested in this idea of uh, appropriation and how far could you go? The artist Mauricio Catalan, he actually once stole someone else's entire show that came in these crates that were delivered to the next door gallery's loading dock and he took them and used them and, and exhibited them as, a, as his own. Um, I had I didn't go that far. These are all Bibles stolen from hotel rooms. Anyway, so a lot of the work I, I've done previously has been conceptually based, but it's also been involved with art, art history, and kind of a certain level of kind of craft, and and always uh, assemblage or collage, always taking ideas and images from different disparate yeah. places and trying to put them together. Um, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna actually just pass through this. This was a project I did where I cast people's hands, made gloves out of them, and then did drawings using their hands. But I don't want to talk about that. But that's a cool image <laughs> of all these gloves of people's hands. Um, one of the last kind of conceptual projects I did that manifested themselves as large digital prints were these 101 portraits. And what I did was I um, would search under someone's name, usually a celebrity, a politician, somebody really well known. And I'd find the first 101 images of, of that person. And then I would put them together in Photoshop at 1% opacity to create a 101% portrait of that person. Um, I call them meta portraits because what they are are portraits of somebody over time, like this Michael Jackson, portrait might include images of him when he was five years old all the way up to when he was 50 and he passed away. Um, and it was, it's interesting because it talks about, um, you know, people's relative celebrity and how they control their images. Some people like Tiger Woods, it's hard to tell that that's Tiger Woods because the images all look different. Same with Michael Jackson. Oprah, on the other hand, <laughs> Almost every picture of Oprah looks the same and has been the same for about 25 years. So this actually looks very much, in, in my mind, like Oprah, Barack Obama. Um, so I use the internet a lot um, to um, find images and use various resources on the internet to make the work. Um, but in the last five years, as you guys may know me as the you know founder and director of Startup Fair. And I started that in San Francisco to help promote artists like myself who um, had lost their galleries or never had gallery representation, but were looking for an outlet for their work um, where they could promote themselves. And um, we did it in San Francisco the first year and it was wildly successful. Um, so we imported it to LA and Chicago and Houston. And that's what I've been doing for the last five years. Here's LA. 
Our last fair was this February 2020 and will probably be the last one for at least another year. Um, even, you know, if the art world even gets back up into gear so we can have um, art fairs anymore. But um, kind of on the side, what I was doing besides doing the fair was I was doing, yeah, this is, don't ask me how I got roped into this picture. I don't know. This was one of our exhibiting artists. I had no idea what I was doing until I took, until I saw this picture. <laughs> Um, but what I've been doing in the last few years is are, are collages, and I've just been doing them very quietly on the side because I haven't had a lot of time. And they started out very, very modestly, just small 8 by 10 and smaller collages, very few objects in them. Very simple and abstract, and they're not conceptual whatsoever. But as I started doing more of them and they started becoming more complex, I found myself drawn to the same kind of material from earlier pieces, art historic stuff from canonical artists, um, Renaissance paintings and contemporary artists. Um, but instead of using them conceptually, I'm just um, looking at the shapes and the colors and the textures and trying to make things that are more um, specifically abstract and, and, and uh, not conceptual. And I have to say, it's been very gratifying to work that way um, because it allows me to explore in a completely different way that I've never done before. Usually the idea is set in the beginning and then the objects sort of follow from that. Whereas these are endlessly fascinating for me because they take all kinds of different forms and shapes. Um, the small collages end up being framed and and you know, done in big installations like this, which I did for MOA last year, and I'll show you that wait, later. Wait, wait, Ray, how big is that? This, it, that wall is probably about 12 feet wide, and that's probably like eight feet tall, and it has like 75 collages on there, but I have hundreds of them. I could fill three walls that size. Um, and they take other forms besides purely abstract. Sometimes there's figurative ones, portrait ones, dancers. Um, pretty quickly after doing those though, I started becoming, um, I started rebelling against the tyranny of the rectangle and I just started cutting out the shapes. So these are small, like eight inch square um, shaped collages using mostly fabrics from uh, Renaissance uh, paintings. Oh. But these also gave me ideas to do much bigger things um, like this, the next one. This is three feet by three feet. It's actually behind me on the wall here. Um, and I'll, I'll walk up to it with the, the camera in a second. Um, these are like eight feet tall. Some of the pieces that I had exhibited at MOA last year. So here's an installation shot of, of my solo show there. This piece is like... 10 feet tall. And then here's that wall of collages. So they they take all kinds of forms now. They have gotten off the wall and become sculpture. Um, oop, thank you. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and I'm gonna show you something on another screen just from my website. So I've done, you know, works on paper that are based off of Henry Moore um, pieces. And that's been really fun. Um, here's some that are um, based off of more fabric. These are 30 by 40 works on paper. So they range now from these little tiny frame pieces What's to these the larger 30 by 40 these? ones. It's some, um, it's paper on paper. Um, in these, in this case, what I've done is um, I've blown, I've taken these Henry Moore um, sculptures, I've scanned them, I've printed them myself on my big Epson 44 inch printer, and then I've used them as elements for a series of pieces. Is that typically what you do? I don't do anything that typically, um, but that's what I've been doing lately. Um, I'm I'm just ex I'm just taking apart these canonical artworks and putting them back together in a more abstract 
playful way. Um, so, and I've done it in lots of different ways. I'm, I'm going to walk you now through my studio real quick to show you the more, the, the really the more recent stuff. Uh, let me see. We've got your okay. face now. Yeah. That's my face. Okay, I got to unplug myself. Ray. Yeah. Think, you're being kind of modest. Like you should tell them some of the collections you're in because it's pretty impressive. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you guys later. Hey, Catherine. Okay. Anybody who's interested in you knowing my career can just go to my website. Um, here's some of the bigger pieces, though. These are the ones that were at MOA. Um, here's that one that started out as a small, um, uh, you know, little shape collage and became like kind of a big one. And you could see that they're you know, three quarter inch and half inch plywood that's been laser cut. They actually stand off the wall on these six inch um, stanchions. Um, yeah. And then I'm trying something a little bit different. So these are, these are relatively solid state. They're basically one um, cut out piece of plywood that I've, you know, collaged onto. Um, but now I'm trying something a little bit different where I'm uh, uh, cutting out the wood shapes and then gluing and screwing them together. So these have a lot more depth if you look at it from the side. And this piece is actually a, a maquette. It's seven feet long, but I'm making one that's about 16 feet. It's going to fill the, the whole wall, hopefully. And then um, somebody asked me if that's what I typically do. I kind of don't typically do a whole thing. I've been making an alphabet, which kind of collage an alphabet. Maybe. That's actually what I do with alphabet. Ray, your microphone is falling out. Oh, can you hear me? We can hear you now. We couldn't for a minute there. Okay. And then here's some more of that Henry Moore stuff. So what this is, this is a, um, a photo out of a book. And I cut out the three-dimensional shape and collaged behind it so it became two-dimensional. But I liked these Henry Moore pieces so much that I thought, God, it'd be really cool if these were kind of three-dimensional. So I just recently did started to do that. So I made that one as a single piece out of three-quarter inch plywood. And then it can kind of fit in space. And then I made these other ones too. We've lost you again, Ray. Uh, I think I might be covering up the, um, I think yeah. I'm covering up my microphone, my hand. Yeah. Anyway, can you see these? Yeah, they're fabulous. Yeah, I just, I just finished these, so I'm pretty excited about them. And they're fun because they're not all the same front and back, so this one's completely different on the back. Oh, wow. That's cool. How are you affixing them to their pedestals, their bases? Well, right now they're just sitting on there, but they'll be okay. doweled in. They'll be what? Doweled in. I'll use a dowel. Okay. So they can be, you know, transported, but then they can secure right now. This one's just sitting in. Ray, what were you doing with the alphabet? Can you explain that a little bit? I don't know what I'm doing with the alphabet. I, 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 I just got kind of... Ray, we can't hear you. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing with the alphabet. I just got kind of interested in it. I don't know. I, I, I saw some other artist work that was using lettering, but just a couple of letters. And then I thought, man, that'd be really great as a collage. Um, and so I'm kind of just going through the alphabet. I guess it's a little bit kind of like exploring the letters a little bit by mood. So each letter has a different feel to it, the way it's collaged. I don't know. I'm just playing around. I don't have any real set reason for doing it, but that's what I've been doing lately. Anyway. Ray, I was just looking at the chat, and um, one of the questions that um, – seems kind of relevant at this point is um, asking you um, your intention in using Henry Moore. What is your connection to his story or his work? 
Um, to me, the connection really is just about um, loving the um, the shapes that he's created, the shapes and the forms. And I had somebody in here recently who was pointing out the fact to me that what I what I am doing is mining the history of essentially dominant white male culture um, by using these Renaissance paintings and Henry Moore sculptures. And it hadn't occurred to me at all until this person made that observation. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not trying to glorify that. I am trying to take it all apart visually or um, uh, formally and put it together in a way that um, makes more sense to me contempor contemporarily. Um, but there's no, I have no intense conceptual reason for doing it other than well, um, but, mining but, my own history, I guess. But let me just piggyback on your friend's comment. Yeah. I think that it's really easy for us privileged, white, heterosexual, Judeo-Christian people to just uh, walk through art history and pick the things that we like. I would challenge you, Ray, to get outside the canon and find some artists of color or some women artists or, you know, find some other artworks that inspire you and see if you can work with them as well. On, on, on principle, you know, on principle. Try yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have any problem with that at all. And in fact, a, a lot of the more contemporary um, artworks that are you'll see in some of the collages do come from artists of color and women. And I'm going to be looking at more of that kind of material because at some point too, I, I just run out of material, even through the thousands of years of art history. Um, be interesting to look at other cultures, other forms, other shapes, other textures. Because really, I'm, since I am working more formally, I could work with any material. Yeah. And some yeah. of the abstract art of uh, Native Americans or Sub-Saharan Africans is so phenomenal on an abstract formalist level. And yet it's rarely considered in formalism or abstraction. You might want to look at some of that. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's what I intend to do. Good. I, I really can't wait to see what you do with that mm -hmm. you know, next phase of expansion. Because this shit is great. And Thank this you. Get greater. Does anybody have any questions? Any th thoughts about this particular body of work or anything, the older stuff? So one of the um, questions coming up in the chat is, do you credit the sources of the objects you look to to incorporate into your work? Um, like the ideas of doing work with other people's hands. Like the, say that again, the last part. Like the idea of doing work with other people's hands. Uh, I'm not quite clear on that, but Would certainly... I credit their hands? <laughs> well, going back to the original or early part of that question, yeah. so you credit the source of the objects you took to incorporate into your work. Um, only when I give a talk like this. No, I don't. Otherwise, I mean, here's what I think. I think most art is built on the back of other art. I think most ideas are an amalgam of many different sources, inspiration, ideas, always has been. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then all art is collage and all art is assembled from other ideas. And I don't feel like I need to credit people. I mean, does... But no one else does that in making no. work. Like, no. so I don't think it's necessary that you do that. No, and I don't feel the need to do that. And with the hands, for example, that project was really uh, problematizing the relationship between the viewer, the maker, and the subject. And so, and it started when Michael Jackson died and my son, Max, who was then six, he's like, God, 
Michael Jackson was cool, Dad. His music is, was, music was so great. And I was thinking, I can't really tell my son about Michael Jackson and the controversy around him. Yeah. But then I thought, wouldn't it be cool? Because I was really inspired when Michael Jackson died. I was, I was inspired by his body of work because they had been nonstop playing his music and stuff. And I was thinking, I would like to do a portrait of Michael Jackson. But then I thought, it'd be more interesting, more problematic if my son Max did a, pro a, a drawing of Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson drawn by the hand of a young boy. But of course, I couldn't get Max to draw Michael Jackson as realistically as I could. So I did the next best thing is I made a glove out of his little hand, out of this rubber that really stretches. And I put it on my hand using his prints and just wiping ink on the paper. Um, and I love that idea. And that's, I, I wouldn't credit Max at all, but I, I had to make uh, evident the fact that the drawing was done by a young boy because that made the whole project. The project was about that relationship. Um, but that's the only credit I gave anybody was crediting who the person was whose hand was the drawing was made with. Anyway, but that's a good know, question. In this time of appropriation, and I guess in the music industry, it's called resampling. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of new rules, right? You get to sort of play around and collage stuff. I think it's always been that way, though. I just think that um, in these days, because business has um, overtaken a lot of industries, particularly the music industry, we've now been more sensitized to this idea of copyright right. and fair use and sampling. It, and it happened when Napster came into play and when hip hop started to sample other people's music, then all of a sudden the hammer came down on who? Artists of color again, of course. And musicians who had very little, you know, um, uh, very little resources to defend themselves. But it's been a tradition forever for people to sample other people's work and use it both as, a, as an act of homage, but also just outright taking licks and incorporating it into their work. Um, but, you know, now we've got the suits involved with music to a, a large degree. So everybody's very afraid of, um, you know, using stuff uncredited. Um, and well, I, wouldn't, wouldn't I wouldn't wholly genre, use anyone's work uncredited. Art, but. Right? We wouldn't have genres of work if, it, if artists weren't looking at each other's You work wouldn't have rock and roll without art. blues. You know, it's you know? Yeah. the money. Like if Ray was making a million dollars and selling at Sotheby's right now, he might get accused of stealing. Like Richard Prince right now is in the courts from stealing oh, from Instagram. Constantly. And but those he's directly taking images without money. credit. He's not licensing them and he's taking them and he's using them without credit. And I'm only using portions of pieces, so yeah. it's- I think it's all about the different. money. As soon as you get famous, that's when they, you know. Or maybe well, about the- Copyright is all about money. You can't yeah. copyright anything if you don't make money from it. You can't, you can't be yeah. sued if you don't, it's about money. Yeah. It's ironic because originally copyright, when it was created in this country, it was supposed to be for 14 years that an artist or anybody could profit off of their idea or their object for 14 years. That's it. Then it went into the public realm. But it's been big corporations over the years that have made it longer and longer and longer. And it wasn't until Disney started to um, uh, tick down on its copyright for Mickey Mouse that it got changed again in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So now copyright is the the life of the artist plus 75 years. Right. So Disney did that so they could continue to profit off of Mickey Mouse into the next millennium. Well, I do think that all artists learn from each other. Yeah. And, and we all incorporate things that we've learned in our work. I gleefully and wholly embrace it. And I believe in what Picasso said that good artists borrow and great artists steal. I, I think we should do that and embrace it and not try to hide it or, you know, or worry about it because it's never going to be the same. You know, I have artists, I have a lot of students 
when I was teaching back a few years ago, they'd always be worried about people stealing their ideas. I'm not going to put my work on my website without a big watermark. And it's like, you know, you should be so lucky that someone steals your ideas. They're so good. Someone steals them, you know, that so rarely does happen, but so what if someone steals your idea, unless they steal it wholly, if they take a portion of it, it'll never be the same. It'll always turn out different because it's been filtered through somebody else's lens. Anyway, that's well, what I think about it. You certainly have a fan with Annie because she said, you taught me that decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know if you guys know this, but Annie and I both went to Mills College and I was Annie's TA in our sculpture class. That's how long we've known each other. Wait, that was only five, ten years ago, right, Annie? Ten, ten years. What at, at most. What at, at most. Um, yeah. Just let me tell you, um, just to re you have a, a lot of compliments, Ray, on, on the chat. One of them, most recent, is I love the way you rift from one thing to another, inventing new ways to manifest the art. So... Yeah, thanks. That's cool. I mean, it's been this particular body of work or just just switching to collage and working less conceptually and more formally has been incredibly freeing. And not only that, collage is very fast, too. And now that I have this big 44 inch printer, I can print anything, any size and use it in any way I want. So it's amazing. And then two doors down from me, I've got a guy who does laser cutting. So all these pieces were cut on a laser cutter. So I don't even have to like do the manual labor to cut out a piece of plywood with a jigsaw. So I can produce quickly, which is great. And since COVID hit, hey, I haven't had any work. So I've just been in the studio every day making work. So it's allowed me to explore um, really rapidly and it's been fun. So, so Ray, you and, and this goes back to one of the questions in the chat, you do um, have your own printer then? Yeah, I have an, a used Epson 9800. It's on its last legs. I bought it from my friend Karen Olson Dunn. Mm. And uh, it, it still works, though. It's great. Um, and um, yeah, I just, I, that's where I get all the stuff. It starts with books that I have that I scan, and then I've got a whole library of images that I can print on demand. I, I just oh. want to point out, too, to everyone that's... Um, here today, you're all part of Keep High You're all fellows, and um, one of the things I wanted to hopefully you all reach out to Ray and thank him. Um, he is so generous with his time and so generous with his expertise in not just you know today sharing his work, but every time and every time each one of you have had a one-on-one -on -one with him, and I'm sure you've all had multiple times, not just during a formal Keep High Pie workshop, but he is has been a great resource. Um, both from uh, the artistic perspective and also from a, a marketing perspective. And I don't know anyone that I have worked with over the last 30 years that I've respected more who has had um, such an impact on my own career. And um, we've just been able to brainstorm and, uh, you know, think about ideas and put things out there. And he's been here from the beginning with Keep High Pie and, uh, and helped me um, kind of visualize what this might look like. Um, he's been a big part of what it is. And I just personally want to say thank you. And you, you, and someone just said you're a rock star. And yes, you took the words <laughs> right out of my mouth. You're a fucking rock star, dude. So thank you so much. Wow. That wow. is quite a compliment. Thank you, Andy. I've totally enjoyed being part of Keep High Pie. It's been really enlightening for me. I mean, I get so much inspiration from all the artists that pass through Ki Pai Pai. I mean, I was thinking about this today when I was putting together this presentation that actually there's, there are parts of this work that really were inspired by other people that I talked to or suggestions people gave me or ideas people gave me just in casual conversations. So it's been a wonderful um, group to be associated with. And obviously I love Andy like everybody else. I've known Andy now since she got fired from her job at Riverside. No, since you quit from your job yeah. at Riverside. It depends on who you ask, right? <laughs> I know. It's true. It's true. Like, that just happened to be and that happened to be the day, Andy, I was coming down to talk to you guys about a show there and then to be in some kind of 
crit group with Peter Frank, yeah. and that was the day you quit. <laughs> hey, I'm not going to be censored, and I'm not going to let my artist be censored, and I think that's... And that's yeah. why I've admired you all this time. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. But I think that I think that with Key Pai Pai, just in closing for this this moment, um, you know, Andy, Key Pai Pai is a community, and we all learn from each other, whether we're the faculty or the fellows or the participants, and that is worth it, it is, there's no words to describe how much it's worth. And I know we're all grateful for that. All of us. I am. I'm grateful too. I am. I am. So. Great, thank you so much. I really Thanks. appreciate it. I hope I didn't go too long. I'm sorry. No, it was fine, Ray. It was, it was fine. A perfect, thank you. Half hour is actually perfect. Thank you so much. It's, it's perfect. Um, Lillian Abel isn't going to join us this evening for okay. technical problems. However, um, the, the next artist that would close out the evening is Voice Love. And I, nice. I, I'm, I know he's, Thanks, Ray. He's, he's linked in. Thank you, Thanks, Ray. Thanks, you guys. It's okay. so Thanks, good Ray. to see your work, Ray. Really, really yeah. great stuff. Fabulous. Great presentation. She's on a bouncy she's ball. Bouncy she ball. is. She is. She's on a bouncy ball. <laughs> yes, she is. So, Voice Love should be queued up. Are you there, Voice Love? Um, I'm here. I'm ready. And All just right. before I start then my I presentation, um, I just want to say that I agree with everything what uh, is spoken tonight because it's uh, it's so hard to have actually community in LA. LA is so disconnected. And having community is really blessing, but having art community is almost a luxury. And this type of like conversations that we have here is extremely important for development of every artist. So um, really thank you for all of that. Um, so I'm gonna start my presentation then. Um, I should uh, share screen. Do you? All guys see my screen? Yep. Yes. Can we see your face? Okay. Yeah, it's, um, I, I don't have PowerPoint, I'm using Google. Um, so um, this is, uh, I'll try to actually fit two different works in this presentation. I'm gonna be <clears throat> fast, but if I'm too fast, feel free to stop me to ask questions. If I'm too slow, um, just tell me you run, run out of time. So um, yeah, this is my installation called um, House for Angels. And it's actually set it up in uh, last year in uh, El Camino uh, College Art Gallery uh, as part of the show <clears throat> titled um, what is it about trees? And um, interestingly enough, in this exhibition, there was few of Ki Pai Pai fellows uh, featured and the exhibition was curated by Susanna Mayer. Uh, so um, in these three walls, I tried to um, build installation that has actually a very ambivalent um, um, message about ecology and what we are experiencing uh, in 2020 right now. So um, everything that you can see on the screen is um, recycled material and this installation is 100% made of recycled material, sometimes my own art, uh, but sometimes it's just like something that I found or um, this uh, for example, on the left side, this um, uh, black um, lines are actually sticks from a different um, uh, from a different locations of wildfires uh, through Los Angeles area. Um, I don't know how big details you can see, but this is all uh, woods are. Um, are burned and they are very, uh, very easy to be crumbled. So um, I also am trying to figure out to uh, make my own ink of this material. So um, here are the 
here are the the installation with um, different views so beside the the burned sticks there are also um there are also stars which are made of maps um do you hear me we can hear yes, you sir. Yeah. Okay. What did you um, say? I'm the having stars some, are some made of strange notifications here. So I also uh, made the stars uh, of uh, maps. So um, also they are made of recycled materials. And I was thinking about maps as uh, you know something that we are not using anymore. But basically, um, I was thinking about maybe you know all these memories that we have from travels from. Um, living in different cities, uh, I was trying to make each star um, as something that is uh, combining at least like rural and urban um, landscape with uh, maybe two different cities. So it's almost like combining um, different memories um, together in the star forms. And I also like the form of um, this Nordic star with eight points, but it's also like arranged as um, as a cross, uh, that's that's the base for uh, creating these stars. Um, and also I painted them in a slightly different uh, blue color, but because of um, my Photoshop, uh, it's kind of like bleached into really blue. It's more like purple, but it doesn't matter. The other part of the installation are those uh, birds, actually angels, uh, which are representing um, kind of uh, uh, seraphims, you know, uh, special type of angels that don't have bodies. They are just like illuminating pure energy and um, they're, they're just like wings. So basically um, this is also recycled material. And just uh, last year I was, this is completely another um, uh, uh, event. This is a theater play that I was invited to do um, artistic direction. So all the birds that I created for this theater play was later destroyed and reassembled in this um, in this uh, new angels forms. Uh, so this is from the another angle, the same installation, and now you can see in the first plan more. Um, dominant this um, column made of the jars filled with drawings that uh, leftovers of the drawings or like just some uh, things and uh, basically more of the angels and one of the uh, tree trunks that was um, part of the tree, living tree uh, from my street where I live in so that's also like something that is found in the environment where I live and uh, this is more of the more of the jars but now you can see the details of the installation and also the the other part of uh, why I'm doing this recycling because I just realized that at some point I become very productive but uh, beside producing art pro producing art I'm also producing a lot of waste so that's why I decided to start to keep actually every part of the drawing that I destroy to keep it and maybe like once a year to uh, do new blending of the pulp and to create my own paper uh, which is quite interesting process and original paper is good enough it's a it's a good quality so um just you know making the pulp of paper it's it's very easy so then you can just add some binders and there is a new uh, sheet of paper so this is the different angles from the same um from the same installation and um this uh this piece particularly uh, i mean the whole installation has more than 150 pieces individual pieces and some of them are crumbling and disappearing and when i'm doing this in because this this was the first exhibition i also did um few um site specific installations in the area where there was a fire uh installing some of the birds and but i do not have right now documentation because it's 100 and uh, uh 360 degree camera and which is not possible to be featured right now on a screen. 
but uh, basically I would install in the nature something um, like this. And um, this is uh, now another opportunity that I got last month to exhibit my um, installation in uh, um, Brea in California. And Lillian is also part of that exhibition. So it's a very uh, nice feeling when you, when you are exhibiting in different places and then you are like uh, figuring out names and works by fellow artists and it's really beautiful. Uh, so this was um, built just like three weeks ago and uh, this is how it looks like today. So um, this is the one uh, work of art that I wanted to share with you and if you have any questions you can ask um, or maybe uh, I can continue with another work. I have a quick question for you. These, yep. these parts, Voice Love, these parts that are um, branches that are burned, mm -hmm. what do you know, I mean, where, where do they come from? Are, did they come from a specific fire that we know about? Or did you actually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, some of them are like, for example, uh, I mean, I'm, I, when I moved here like three years ago, now it's going to be three years in a few days, um, I was really blown away with, uh, with the, you know, scale of the fire because I never witnessed such a big fires. So that's why there are like, for example, some pieces from Malibu area. There are some pieces from uh, Sepulveda Basin area wildfires. Um, there are some wildfires from the different... Um, highways uh, that I wouldn't even know to not, you know, to say yeah. what's the part of the city. But this is definitely LA fires. And this is all around us. There is something like on a, on a, on a way to Lancaster. And, you know, after a few days after the fire, I would just go there and like pick up something or maybe even wait for a longer time and then come and pick all these pieces and then I would create something more about from them. So that's the that's the different fires. It's not one. Okay, I see. Thank you. I I love the way that all the vessels that are hovering over that that tree stump feel like they're holding all the energy from what would have been there if the tree was there, right? Like every single vessel is just chock full with like life inside of it, um, and it has like like the Hawaiians call it mana, like the spirit is all hovering Perfect. above the, that tree stump. It's so like if the tree had actually been there, like what that energy would have been and you've like kind of captured it in all these like glass vessels. I love that piece. So incredible. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. I mean, yeah, it's, it's it, this piece, this whole installation is about capturing this energy. And um, I was thinking a lot about what Betty is saying when she's saying like, but why are you doing something? Like it's it, everything what you did is okay, but like why you are doing that? And um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's that spirit, you know, sometimes you are kind of like, you feel the call to do something, to create something. And then it's almost like spirit uh, conquer you and then you have to do it. So this is very slow work of art that uh, I'm still working. I'm still developing. This is, just uh, you know form of an installation i was really like to create more of like my own ink my own paper my own uh, you know uh, maybe some like video art also like video installations because i would love to um, uh, create some uh, like effects with the projection on these stars and on these uh, woods but particularly also to combine documentary material from the sites um, yeah, thank you for, for a comment. Um, and you're getting yeah, a lot of comments. Uh, you're getting a lot of comments, voice love in the chat, which is all- Oh, I'm not able actually to read them now. Well, uh, I'm reading them for you. And, and a lot of them are suggesting a spiritual uh, um, attitude or a spiritual sensibility in the work. But one person is asking why, uh, in fact, it's, um, I think it's Mart asking why the jars. 
I, I, I really like the, the idea of the purity of the material. So we have paper, which is basically wood. We have their like maps, which is again, a wood, you know, it, everything is made of wood and then burned wood, carbonized burnt wood. Uh, plus ink is also made of the carbon black, uh, which is uh, again made of wood. Uh, so um, it's it's very like woody. So um, I really felt that also the the glass has that you know it's transparent. It's something that we are using on a daily basis. I was I'm eating a lot of stuff from the jars from Trader Joe. Like I love olives and like all sorts of stuff. So I'm like every time when I'm buying something, I'm realizing how much waste I'm producing with just living. And, you know, a lot of questions, actually, I started to ask myself about, like, you know, idea about being innocent is not possible anymore, because uh, the idea of innocence comes from Christian idea, you know, uh, about there are some sins, but only sins towards, like, community or yourself. But we have a great responsibility towards our towards our environment and that's one of the things that we have to learn to be innocent towards environment we have to figure out how to to keep the environment clean so collecting jars was accidental i mean i have to do it i cannot throw them out uh, i i like to keep them and also um they are part of my artistic process because you know, I started this very traditional academy in Belgrade and we learned to make our own materials. I, I learned to make my own, own paintings and glass as a, as a use of glass was always part of my artistic practice. So I would, I would mix the colors on my own and I, I liked just the idea that I can preserve them. Also, they are also uh, seen, I see them as individual pieces there could be like individual sculptures. Uh, but right now for this occasion, for this like, uh, you know, and there is also those two lines. One is always diagonal, uh, which is full of these stars and everything is kind of like twisted. And this vertical, strong vertical above the missing tree, uh, which is actually an invitation for that spiritual uh, enlightenment or something. Um, and I also like to play with, with the, when you have a glass, if you play with light and then creating a different um, uh, shadows, that's also like so, I, I, I don't want to say primitive, uh, but in Serbian, when I say primitive, it means like primal. It means like, uh, uh, I don't know how to say that in, in, in English, but you know, primal, that's the... It's almost like playing some some uh, games from like uh, last millennium, you know, <laughs> from uh, when there was no TV or something. It's just creating your own play with shadows and something. And it's really interesting also how these jars uh, create a sound. Unfortunately, I don't have um, recorded here because I I recently purchased 360 degree camera. So when you when you put the wind uh, to actually move them, you can record the beautiful sound and also like in slow motion. It's so th th there are a lot of other works uh, related to this work. Um, yeah, I would love to uh, if we have time enough. I would love to share actually another uh, work of mine. Yes, you're all okay do. but before you move on, I must say. It is fascinating in this installation image that you have that on the right, you can look out the window up there and see, you know, trees growing in, I guess, a reasonably nurturing um, space. And it, it, it's fascinating how the two play off each other, but, you know, as an aside, but please, yes, go on. Yeah, I'm also very grateful. They they built it this wall for me, and I was like, "This is the best place I could get there." So uh, it's really beautiful. So tell me again where this installation is photographed. So this particular photograph is part of ongoing exhibition right now uh, in Brea. Um, that's a Brea Art Gallery, Brea City Gallery. 
and it's part of the annual exhibition made in California. Um, and also um, Lillian is part of the show. Um, and there are a few other artists also. So uh, it's, it's really interesting. Um, so uh, right and Ms. now- And Liz Gordon said she's got tons of jars. Should anybody be <laughs> interested in jars? So if you need backups, voice <laughs> I would love this garden yeah, is, I, is your person. <laughs> Sometimes I would really love to build like uh, a beautiful scenography of just jars for the video. So um, I would probably just borrow them for a short period of time and and yeah, do some installation for the video. And yeah, so this is the a work that I um, recently finished and some of you had opportunity to see the film, but I'm gonna also um, uh, feel free to share this link with everybody on Keep I Pie, uh Facebook page. Uh, the link is hidden because the film is right now in a different selection processes for, um, uh, for different festivals. It was not made originally to be featured in the festivals. It was more made to be um, like a story for the exhibition and to be part of like some um, gallery spaces. Uh, but basically the whole film is featuring the guy or me uh, carrying a flag. And this is the flag that was uh, used originally in the film. And I started to make flags because of um, just an idea of what means to be to belong to any particular nation or to be part of some, um, you know, what is the, the, the constructed part of our identity as, for example, national identity. So I wanted to create like just flags made of weeds and uh, particularly um, weeds that, you know, because we usually when we think about weeds, we think about something bad, something that is like wasting our space or our, um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, it's something that should be erased or burned out or like treated with pesticides. But in the same time, all these wild plants are so important for our environment because they are truly part of the ecosystem. And in the same time, on a spiritual level, all the magical level, um, they are part, uh, they, they do have this amazing power of surviving, of life. And um, these are all parts of the series that I called um, Age of Fertility. And uh, there are a lot of uh, paintings made on, uh, on, on, the, on the silk. Um, and basically, I'm, I could actually mention this, that both of my grandmothers were kind of like uh, involved in different spiritual practices. And one of my grand grandmothers, um, she was really uh, doing a lot of um, healing with plants, uh, including some uh, spoken word. But basically, I was introduced with this uh, practice of the Slavic uh, nations when I was very, very young. So my love towards the plants comes very early and I really wanted to keep that. And also the, the second part of that is that um, me as a queer person really identify a lot with the, with the weeds. So uh, when you see now in this shot, which is just a part of the um, part of this film, when you see someone carrying this flag through different uh, um, parts of America, it's, it's that type of like um, a love towards, towards the, the environment and also re respecting the environment, bringing that, um, that power back to the nature. So this is the, the film that I uh, shot in the course of two years uh, on a different route trips around uh, Midwest and West Coast. Um, together with my partner, uh, we shot in numerous locations. Uh, I mean, we were like in Los Angeles area a lot, but we were also in Las Vegas, in Monument Valley, Red Arches, Zion, like uh, so many national parks and literally two years of recording and maybe like 15 states 
of um, beautiful landscapes uh, with just, you know, some simple shots of the landscapes and also like of me carrying this flag, like um, what's the word for Hodo uh, Chosche means, uh, um, uh, I don't have the word. What is the word? It's it's a it's a it's a pilgrim pilgrimage or pilgrim pilgrimage you know? yes yes yeah so it's a, it's a kind of like spiritual quest through the different landscapes of America and after two years of recording basically um, I was I mm. I sit down and I edited uh, I mean I had like maybe ten hours of material that I could use but basically I just cut it out to the 18 minutes and then the whole film was given to the American composer Joseph Corrillo uh, who also works for Universal Music and then he created original score for the film uh, which then kind of like opened this door to maybe festivals because I was originally thinking only about presenting this video in a gallery space because the narrative is not um, is not typical like that you have to sit in the theater and then look something for half of an hour when you are stuck in the in the seat you actually can go out and like you actually can go in the gallery and basically experience just parts of the video you don't have to see the whole thing um and that's the that's the beauty i believe of a video art because we can present this in so many different uh forms this work and uh, right now, um, this work is presented in Belgrade in a show um, about love towards the uh, homeland. And it's also presented in, um, in uh, one festival in India and one festival or one exhibition in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, Pantarota, which means broken screens. Um, and it's really interesting to actually just let the video art travel instead of you, you don't have to. And, it's, and then, you know, Corona happened and basically I just realized that this is um, really the most, uh, the best way to tell this story is just to send the link and to apply for festivals and to just send it to the friends. So I'm gonna send this um, uh, this link to all of you by through sharing it through the through the um, Pie Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, at the end, I would love just to show one more thing. But um, you can, if you have any um, questions, I can answer. So before you go to the next thing, let me just say that some of the chat is um you know it's 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 extremely complimentary voice love uh, to this piece and um you know your drawing of weeds is strong video art can be very freeing um liz gordon said by the way you don't have to return the jars if you if you need some you can just come get them <laughs> okay <laughs> and, um, in the film, um, this is from Jeannie Dunn, in, in your film, the onset of twilight and your form silhouetted against the setting sun is absolutely beautiful and poetic. And Annie is um, suggesting that your film reminds her of the Shirin Nassat show that was at the Broad last year. Did, oh yeah, did, of course. Or, I mean, she's, she's my great inspiration. She's yeah. really amazing. Yeah. Uh, I love her so much. And her videos are capturing actually energy and, and life energy, life force of, of her heroes. Um, and that's something that I'm truly admiring. Um, of course, my video is, is different in the sense of what, what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, I, I, I adopted a lot of things uh, from her. And also I was working um, on television for almost 10 years and um, I was producing a lot of films for a cultural uh, program in Serbia and this type of like free form of a video or a video art is really something that I enjoy uh, strict. 
So th thank you for comparison. That's like more than flattering for me. That's beautiful. Thank you. So you want to go to the remaining? Oh, I'm just going to finish with one thing, uh, which is uh, basically um, something that I felt that is really uh, lifting up my, uh, my time after Corona started. So this is something completely different. This is my patio and this is my mural. I haven't done mural in a long time, like in maybe a few years. And I was really feeling that I want to do something like just to lift up the energy of my space. So, and also like to bring energy in a sense of like bringing the, the, the birds here. And like, after I finished the, the, so previous two works were done in like almost two years, courses of two years. And this mural is made in basically four days. And that's something that I just wanted to share to, to, to you know, show to everyone that, uh, you know, we should all paint something. It's like this, this color is so bright. And after I painted this, um, I started to have like uh, visitors like parrots from the neighborhood and like uh, hummingbirds. And it becomes so, so happy place. So I'm, I'm very uh, glad that I have this um, in my backyard. <laughs> I think you should make yeah. one of those for Andy in Lancaster. I, oh, I mean, I would love to paint oh more God. stuff. We were just saying that here. We were all like, oh, we want that here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, should, you guys should do it. That would be great. Oh, my God. oh it's beautiful. lovely. It's, it's, yeah, charming. I, I yeah. really enjoyed it. And the, I mean, this is silly to say, but then uh, in Ikea, they basically had amazing pillows that were fitting so much with the whole thing. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, I just wanted to create more positive energy around me and to be more, more productive. So this really uh, lift up and you don't see here some flowers, but basically tomorrow, that, that day when I finish tomorrow, like five parrots figure out that I have sunflowers and then they started to come over regularly. So that was really wow. fun. Really cool fun. That is lovely. That's awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You so what much a beautiful for... presentation. The work is so amazing. I'm so... Oh. So thrilled to see how much growth has happened for you over the last couple of years. Really, like I'm thrilled. I'm I'm so happy to hear that. I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I think it speaks well also for all of the Key Pie Pie artists and their um, commitment to push their their game forward and to seriously consider their work as um, honorable and spiritual and um, worthy of 100% commitment. And I think it's a phenomenal group of people and, you know, we're cool, we're cool. I, I wanna say I that it's that truly category. amazing. Yeah, absolutely, agree. Yeah. yeah. Boislav, did you have something you wanted to say? Um, I, I want to say that, you know, really having community, artistic community that you can share your like ideas and to talk about and listen how other people are interpreting, um, you know, different, uh, not works particularly, but different subjects. It's very, very um, uh, nurturing uh, and very yeah. healthy. It's really one of the best. I mean, I participated in so many programs in Europe in like different artistic development programs. Uh, but what I find here as the, the biggest um, deal with this is that this is really healthy community where we are really invited to talk with each other. And it's, it's not about like projects it's it's about truly about artistic development of, of individual artists and as a group and i'm i'm very blessed to to be part of this uh, i'm very grateful thank you thank you all thank you andy <laughs>
Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy that you're part of our community. And I, I hope that everyone that watched this today, um, also those that will be able to go back and, you know, view it on the recording, um, will find some inspiration in uh, the work that you've been doing and seeing that they just, they, that as Ray said, you can kind of rebel against the tradition, the tradition and, um, and, and take your work to different levels. And it always, it doesn't have to be the static traditional two dimensional piece on the wall. It, it can be something beyond that. And I'm so happy to see that. And I think you're going to be a great inspiration for others. Thanks Voice Love. Yep. Thank you. Thank yeah. And thank you, Andy, for making this happen because we are all fully in debt to you for, uh, as Vaslav said, this wonderful community that is so rare and precious. Well, it's my pleasure and I feel very lucky to be surrounded by so many amazing and creative people and truly. Um, but I, and I'm just, we're adding more folks to our community. Um, our first uh, virtual Key Pai Pai workshop is taking place tomorrow. Um, we're starting tomorrow and Sunday. And so you'll start to see some new faces um, uh, start popping up on our fellows page. I think we have um, seven artists. Uh, six of those are from Hawaii um, and we're working with them this weekend. And so welcome them as they come on board and uh, sorry about the sirens. Um, I, um, I know we're definitely gonna do next Friday. So if you are listening and you haven't done a presentation yet and you want to, please speak with Catherine. She organizes that. Um, yes, we'll, please. Yeah, please. we'll see you guys all next uh, Friday at seven o'clock. And um, for those faculty members and mentors, um, I will see you all tomorrow. Yeah, baby. Thank you, Thank you Andy. Thank you, Voice Love. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you all. Thank Good you, night, Ray. everybody. Good night, everybody. Aloha. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you, Bye. everybody. Bye, Jeannie. Bye. This is so cool. <laughs>